Transvision 2022, organisé par l'Association française transhumaniste. Voilà, alors nous reprenons nos débats pour cet après-midi par une première table ronde sur un aspect bien particulier du transhumanisme et une forme plus originale peut-être du longévitisme en s'intéressant à la cryonie ou cryopréservation. Nous espérions avoir avec nous Max Moore, malheureusement, et Natacha Vitamon ne pourra pas être là. Natacha est malade, mais l'un comme l'autre ont quand même... Dans dans les derniers moments, réussi à nous faire parvenir euh, des vidéos qui euh, donc répondent aux questions que nous leur aurions posées. Euh, donc, euh, nous ne les avons pas en, en direct, nous allons les, les écouter quand même en, en différé. Voilà, je ne la fais pas plus longue et ensuite nous, nous appellerons nos, nos invités pour cette table ronde. Hello, for this panel discussion, I will be in my role as Alcor's ambassador and president emeritus. So it's my job at Alcor to talk to the media, talk to groups of people, uh, to convey the idea of cryonics, do a lot of writing. So I have a, you know, a lot of experience in trying to communicate these ideas. Uh, but I don't think I have to work too hard on that here. Hopefully most of you are at least reasonably familiar with cryonics at this point. If not, you really should be. And I'll get some idea of why as I go through. The first question that Mark sent me, I have eight questions to go through very briefly. What is your specific approach? How is your approach different from others? Now, I'm taking that to mean Alcor's approach, me as an Alcor representative. And of course, there are many things I could say about that. One is that we are not the low cost option. We are the doing as much research as possible, doing the best job we can, doing as little damage to you as possible option. Uh, it's very much our philosophy that we cannot rely on our, our friends in the future to solve all our problems for us. We have to do as, as good a job as we can today. And that takes resources, that takes spending, that means that we have to charge a certain amount for this process. That's not for everybody. Some people may want to take a low cost option, um, have a funeral director ship them to their organization or however they do it, but that's not the way we've chosen to approach it. And I think you have to be very clear about that. One is not necessarily better than another. It depends on what you value, what your estimates are, or how much damage can be repaired and so on. Uh, so that's one, one part of, of our, um, our difference. I would say another important part is that uh, Alcor's approach is very uh, cautious in a sense. And this might seem a little bit odd for something like cryonics, but we're kind of conservative. We look at the very long time frame that we're having to do this. Alcor's already in its 51st year of operation. Uh, despite what the single Singularitarians might say, I think it's going to take at least another 50 years, maybe 100 years, maybe more. So we have to be around for the long term. And that means you have to plan for that, you have to structure for that, you have to invest for that. If you want your patients to survive over many decades, then you can't be reckless with your finances. So what Alcor's done is we have a patient care trust fund, uh, which took a lot of work to set up in quite a few years. And what that means is we now have a separate fund into which a large portion of the money paid for the cryopreservation process is placed. That money can no longer be touched for any purpose other than maintaining the patients and hopefully eventually reviving and rehabilitating them. Now, other organizations, as far as I know, don't do that. I think some of them might be thinking of doing that, but currently they just have a common pool of money and uh, for operations, for marketing, for research, and for maintaining their patients. It's not divided up. Uh, that's not the way we like to do things because our patients are helpless. They need us to take care of them. And so it's very important to have a dedicated pool of money that can only be used for that purpose. And in addition to that, we invest it in a way that is quite conservative and cautious. We realize that over a short period of time, we could probably draw four or five or six percent, like they do at some university endowments and probably do okay. But when you look over a long period of time, you realize that becomes an extremely dangerous proposition. Now, traditionally, people have said for retirement, we draw maybe around four percent. That's become under question today. But that's, that's thinking of 20 or 30 years. When we're thinking of possibly 100 years or more with all the ups and downs of, of markets, uh, that becomes very dangerous. And so what we've settled on under expert advice is a withdrawal of approximately no more than 2% a year of assets. Um, and that's how we determine what's charged for the cryopreservation. So with that uh, percentage withdrawal, we should be able to survive pretty much any situation over the very long term. Uh, we've also devised you know, our governance methods in similar line. We have a self-elected board of directors self-perpetuating rather than a member elected board. Uh, one reason for that is if you have a member elected board, especially as a relatively small organization, it's very easy for outside parties who are hostile to come in and take you over because they just have to get a new people, enough new people, maybe just a few hundred or a few thousand people to come in and completely change the organization. So we've chosen a, you know, a fairly cautious governance system. Next question is, what is the difference between the situation in Europe and the United States? 
Well, I have a little bit of an uh, unusual perspective on this, perhaps not unique anymore, but a little different. I started the first Clarinx organization in England back in 1986, along with a few other people. And then next year I moved over to the States, so I've been with Alco for a long time. And so I have some understanding of, of England and America. Of course, the rest of Europe is a little different. Um, one major difference to take into account is in the US, and not so much in England, but a little tiny bit less so true today, the default in our legal system basically is that something is legal unless there's a law against it. Now, in other countries with more of a Roman law system, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, if you do some activity, then it may be that you'll be shut down by a government agency, by bureaucrats, because there's no law in favor of it. Now, that can make a big difference, and that's something that uh, European crisis are going to have to really address carefully. Uh, for instance, the only actual law in the world, as far as I know, that is supportive of cryonics is in California. And that's because we had a big legal battle back, back there uh, a few decades ago. And uh, in the end, with a constitutional lawyer, we got the California to establish essentially a right to be cryopreserved. I don't believe that exists anywhere else right now. And it might be quite hard to establish that. But that's something that Europeans can cautiously work towards. Again, there's a risk that if you get too much involved in politics or try to push the European Union into having a rule, the rule may not be the one you want. So <laughs> I would say step very carefully there. So that's a major difference. The other difference that would seem obvious is, of course, that the United States has had uh, some pretty solid crown organizations for several decades, uh, primarily the Alcohol Life Extension Foundation, founded in 1972, and Cryonics Institute in 1976. Um, in Europe, you don't really have that, but in a sense, it's not really so different, because apart from those two, uh, you don't have much else. You have a couple of much smaller ones that have started more recently, so it's not so different from Europe, where... Uh, you haven't really had anything very much apart from local groups that kind of talk about the ideas until very recently with tomorrow biostasis. So in a sense, it's not so different in that there haven't been anything, uh, haven't been any new organizations starting for a long time either side. So there's still, uh, it's still largely a virgin territory in some sense. It's also virgin territory, surprisingly still in the United States in that despite hundreds and hundreds of interviews and talks I've given and, and articles about this, I still find that the vast majority of people have never even heard of cryonics. And if they have, they have a very poor understanding of it. So we're not really in such drastically different situations. Education is tremendously important. Um, and marketing, in the sense, because we have to reach people. But by marketing, I would say uh, marketing in a way that informs people, gives them informed consent, and allows them to make uh, a decision knowing what they're doing, not just you know, pushing, pushing, getting new members for its own sake. Now, what is the situation in Russia and elsewhere in the world? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to avoid talking about Russia. Um, but to, to think about other countries, uh, as you'll hear today uh, from Emil and perhaps others, Switzerland is doing really well. I'm very impressed with what's going on in Switzerland and Germany with uh, Tuara Biostasis and the European Biostasis Foundation. That's very promising. Uh, as you know, I can't speak for Alcor officially, but from my point of view, I welcome that development. We have members in Europe. We may lose some members. Um, we may have some cooperative relationships that can benefit all of us. But because it's such a long distance from us, I think that's a good development. The same thing is true of Australia, where a very solid effort has been put together, and it's looking like that's about to really get going for real now. And that's a great thing. We have members in Australia. That's a very long way for us to go, so we can hardly urge people who want to join that organization. So I think it's interesting that uh, we're seeing things spreading around internationally. Of course, China mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. China is an interesting situation, and it's quite different from anywhere else. Uh, for one thing, the Crown organization, Yang Feng, is part of a very large, uh, well-resourced medical organization. So they have a lot of resources. They can afford to spend a lot more money than anybody else can. Uh, the other difference is that they're supported by the Chinese government. No other organization can claim support from their government. That, of course, is a bit of a double-edged sword. In the good sense, as long as that lasts, that's, that's very helpful for them. But, of course, the government could change their mind at some point, and then it could be very bad for them. Uh, so certainly a very different model, interesting to keep an eye on that. See, the next question we have, uh, where are we with thawing techniques? What works and what doesn't? What is the roadmap to get there one day? Uh, well, there's a lot of there's three major approaches really to rewarming. The issue, for those of us not, not so familiar with the idea, is um, maybe kind of surprisingly, the main problem, one of the main problems with uh, reviving cryopreserved tissue is that as you rewarm, you can actually get recrystallization. That might seem kind of puzzling that if, as you warm up, you get ice crystals forming, but that happens. And that's a very bad thing. And that's one of the reasons why it's hard to revive large bodies of tissue. So as, as you should know by now, hopefully, uh, of course, we can cry preserve and rewarm successfully all kinds of things from eggs, sperm, embryos, corneas, heart valves, skin, and other tissues like that. But as you go from single small tissues to larger bodies of tissues, whole organs, for instance, 
uh, certainly mammalian organs, something of that size, and certainly to whole human beings or brains, that's something we cannot currently reverse successfully, in part because we cannot sufficiently uh, warm it up at a sufficiently rapid rate. So there's a number of ways of doing that, electromagnetic warming or dielectric warming. Uh, there's nano warming, where nanoparticles are used. And more recently, uh, some researchers in Spain are suggesting using uh, high-intensity focused ultrasound, or HIFU. Uh, so there's a lot of research in this area, and it looks promising, but not being a technical expert in those areas, I'm not going to try and lay out a detailed roadmap. Um, I think that if you want to know more about that, you can check out some of the talks we had at the Alcor 50 conference that we're gradually putting online. Um, the talks from Switzerland, where also um, Ramon Risco gave some talks on this issue. So you can find out a lot more about that from, from those two conferences. Since I'm running short of time, quickly on the ethical issues... What is the point of cryonics? Well, hopefully that's fairly obvious. It's not to die. Essentially, cryonics is, is a bridge between today, when we have no way to actually extend the human lifespan, certainly not in more than very marginally, to the future when we've conquered the problem. In my view, as I've argued in recent talks, I don't think we've, we've made any significant progress on life extension in the last 30 more years that I've been watching this. I'm not as optimistic as some that we will in my lifetime or in, in the lifetime of most other people. So we're going to need cryonics as a bridge to that future. The next question involved uh, challenging the idea that in the future, coming back in a radically different environment when the people you know uh, are gone and the society has radically changed, will you really be the same person? Have your, has identity really been preserved? Um, you know, I could get into a lot of detail on that, but my answer is that, uh, no, you haven't lost your identity in that situation. I take my, my personal example as one example. I moved from England to California. It was a pretty radical change. A lot of people I didn't know. Everything was very different in many ways. And other people have gone through much larger transitions than that one. And they don't lose their identity. Obviously, they're going to start to change what they do. They may have different careers, meet different people, may develop in a different direction than they would have. But the way they react is still going to be based on their personality, their traits, um, their tendencies. So I, I think that it, it doesn't mean you're not the same person. It means you're going to have a different set of challenges and you're going to develop differently than you would have if you'd stayed in the present, obviously. But no, I don't think it changes who you are. Uh, for the long answer, read my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> uh, let's see, a couple more questions very briefly. Can we anticipate the motivations of those who will be in charge of reanimating bodies and suspended animation for a very long term, a very long time? Why would they do it? Or in his, whose interests? Well, from Alcor's perspective, one reason we will bring patients back is because it's in our mission statement. It's a core part of what we want to do. It's not just to cryopreserve people. It's not just to wake them up and shove them out the door and pat them on the back and say, good luck. It's actually part of our mission to revive and rehabilitate patients. They're going to need that, obviously, just like people returning from long-term comas today. Also, of course, there's a contractual obligation. Uh, if we weren't to bring patients back, then we'd be liable for, for, not, for violating our contract. Uh, there are other things that uh, you can consider. There's a very strong personal incentive to bring people back. The vast majority of people at Alcor, all the directors and all the leaders of Alcor, are members themselves, and they're going to want this for themselves. They may have relatives in cryopreservation um, uh, or, or pets. I have my first my first dog, and Dasha, my first dog has been cryopreserved. So there's a lot of personal incentive to bring people back. Um, and if you think about it, even if we conquer aging and you know, inevitable biological death, we're still going to die of various things, whether being attacked or being hit by an asteroid or falling off a mountain or whatever it is. There are going to be conditions we can't necessarily immediately fix and we'll still need cryonics. So the organization will still be around. They need to maintain their reputations. Finally, um, what is the method, model for deciding who can and cannot benefit from cryonics? Um, uh, currently, the only reason to be financial. Wouldn't it be interest of organizations suppose mutual solutions themselves, pooling of capital and drawing of lots? I'm not really sure what drawing of lots means. <laughs> Does that mean you're going to cry because of people who don't want it? Or is this drawing from people who do, who can't pay? It's not, I'm not too clear what that means. But to me, the, the vital issue is voluntary choice and informed choice. You cry because of people who've chosen to do that. And yes, it has to be people who've made arrangements for it and can fund it. Um, I think there's a big problem in the idea of pooling resources in some sense, certainly for things like research, you may want to pool resources. But if you expect an organization that spends a lot of money, charges its members more so they can do more research, have better response capability, if they're expected to subsidize other organizations which don't, that to me is a, is a poor idea. That's a recipe for, uh, for disaster because you're going to take resources from the people who are providing it to those who, who aren't bothering to do it. That doesn't seem like a good model. Let's keep our model distinct and let people choose which one they want to do. There are lots of possibilities. You can go for you know, a full-blown uh, whole-body cryopreservation alcohol. You can go for a neuropreservation. You can go 
uh, to CI and have a, a less expensive one, perhaps with no standby, you can choose that. Uh, you can go to the Neural Archives Foundation and just have your brain preserved, or with uh, Oregon Cryonics, and there'll be other options in the future. So I think rather than forcing cross-subsidization, instead let these different models flower and then choose from among them. You know, I think my time is up. Thank you for your attention. Alors, j'invite José Cordero, qui est déjà à côté de moi, Taya, Taya, merci, Taya Maki, qui était déjà avec nous un petit peu plus tôt, et également Emir, euh, voilà, Kanzura, qui nous vient droit de, de Madrid, où tu es repassé, hein. il a fait un crochet à la maison. Ah, mais je lui parle en français, je suis bête. Oui, je, je m'excuse par avance, je vais rester en anglais, ça me, en français, pardon. Ça méritera de, ça m'évitera de, de, de dire des choses que je comprends pas moi-même. Alors, les, les questions auxquelles euh, a répondu euh, Max Mont sont à peu près les questions que je, je vais essayer de vous poser, euh, peut-être en raccourcissant. Euh, un petit peu ou en synthétisant euh, en en synthétisant quelques-unes euh, donc en restant dans un premier temps euh, dans cette perspective d'essayer de décrire la diversité de ce qui est offert par euh, le transhumanisme en, en général je vais vous demander euh, notamment selon vos démarches successives, alors je vais vous demander de vous présenter, de présenter vos organisations en, en deux minutes alors, je vais reprendre donc, je vais vous demander de, 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 de vous présenter hein, ra rapidement dans le contexte de euh, la cryopréservation. Donc de présenter vos organisations respectives en, en deux minutes, euh, mais surtout d'insister, euh, si vous le pouvez, sur ce qui, à votre avis, fait la spécificité de la vôtre. Hein, Max a un petit peu parlé de Alcor, normal. Euh, et alors, euh, comment dire, il y a d'autres organisations qu'il a évoquées rapidement, euh, mais il serait intéressant si vous savez, par exemple, nous dire davantage, puisqu'il l'a dit, il a choisi, par exemple, de ne pas parler de la Russie. Euh, il serait intéressant, si c'est possible, d'avoir quelques informations euh, supplémentaires sur ce qui existe en Russie, indépendamment de tout contexte géopolitique. Euh, alors... Euh, Emir, est-ce que tu veux commencer à nous dire donc quelle est ton organisation, quelle est sa spécificité All right. No, happy to start. Um, yeah, so I'm Emil. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Tomorrow. Take this mic. I'm afraid. All right. Once again, I'm Emil. I'm the founder and CEO of Tomorrow Bio, which is a European cryopreservation organization based in Berlin, but uh, covering all of Europe. And I'm also um, a founder and uh, the president of the board at the European Biostasis Foundation, which is a non-profit research foundation based in Switzerland that does everything from basic to applied research for the field of cryopreservation and also acts as a long-term storage facility. So basically, people can now choose if they would like to, to not only have their, their bodies long-term stored in the US at Elko CI and so on, but also in Europe, in, in Switzerland. Um, so, so basically, so I, I, I was a long time an Elko member. I still am an Elko member if I'm in the US. But as Max already briefly said, of course, Elko is relatively far away, right? If anything happens to, to someone in Europe, then Of course, in cryopreservation, time is very much an issue, right? So you want to cryopreserve as quickly as possible after circulatory rest to not have ischemia and so on and so on. So it's arguably uh, much easier if there's a European organization. Um, and, and we've built that over the last couple of years and probably will continue to build that for the next 20 or 30 years, right? Because there's a tremendous amount of research that needs to be done to make cryopreservation really, really good. But if push comes to shove and the alternative is cremation or burial, then I would very much argue that cryopreservation is probably the way to go. Um, maybe really briefly from me, I'm, I'm a doctor by training, then did a lot of cancer research stuff and entrepreneurship stuff in the past. Um, actually, originally was the plan to go into what we would now call in quotation marks the tra traditional longevity research field. And then over time, I got more and more disillusioned because uh, as Max said, I don't think there's much indication that actually living longer, pushing maximum lifespan, doesn't seem to be much results in that regard. And then I switched over to cryopreservation, hoping that I never will be cryopreserved. But if need be, I'll definitely choose that option. Can, can you tell us a little bit if there is, or maybe there is not difference uh, uh, from the, the technical point of view uh, with uh, Alcor? 
Um, so there are some smaller differences. So first of all, of course, we're in Europe, right? So location-wise, it just is very difficult to cover Europe if you're based in, in the U.S. and have your standby teams in the U.S., right? So we have standby teams here in Europe. Um, there are a couple of other differences. So we focus on what, what is called whole-body field cryoprotection, meaning that if someone is has either either died or is close to dying, we dispatch a, a, an SST, a standby team that does stabilization. Oh, sorry, standby, stabilization, and transport. And in that in that part, what we do, we already perfuse the cryoprotective agent on site and cool down to around minus eighty degrees, either on site or on the way to the long term storage facility in Switzerland. Um, Alco does that in some cases, um, but not in all of them. And actually, the whole body part is not currently done at all. And arguably, if you do the perfusion on site, you have more time for transport. Um, and arguably, in certain cases, there's better quality. And um, we at least we, we 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 have our own standby teams. That's also a difference, right? Elco has outsourced standby teams with suspended animation and ICE, international cryomedical experts. So if you have your own team, you have a bit more control, um, which I like a lot. And our teams have, have always like perfusionists and doctors on staff, um, which arguably is a soft factor. Um, but yeah, it's a factor, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Taya, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your institute uh, and cryonic institute and uh, if there is um, other technical uh, differences uh, with uh, uh, alcohol, for example? So just to clarify, um, it's not Cryonics Institute. It's actually, um, I'm the president of an association called Société Cryonics de France. Juste pour dire aussi que je parle en français, mais pour aujourd'hui, je parle en anglais comme c'est la journée anglais. Mais uh, comme c'est une association française, uh, n'hésitez pas à nous parler après. So uh, the association really has been around since 1967, and um, a man called Roland Missonnier was the original founder. I was hoping he'd be here today, but he uh, he's couldn't make it. So he asked me to restart the association in 2014 when I met him at a Chronix uh, event in Germany. And um, originally I'm from Canada, but I've been living here in France for 13 years, and Chronix is something I've been passionate about for quite some time, again, a lot for the same reasons that Emil was talking about, also being really interested in longevity, a little, I'm, I'm less familiar with transhumanism, but all these topics are very interesting. So basically, our association, uh, the goal is to reunite people in France, to have a solid uh, foundation to help educate people because, again, uh, being educated, being informed about what cryonics is, what it involves, and what you need to do to be able to do it uh, is very important and also something that's really lacking here in France. Uh, so we have um, a basis of membership and we're going to eventually, we have some short-term goals and some long-term goals. So right now the, the, main, uh, the main challenge is to be able to lead legally transport a body outside of France uh, because uh, if, I, if I have a chance to show you later the slides, there's been some really interesting history about chronics in France and it's not a good idea to try to preserve uh, a body here in France. So for the time being, we're lucky to have uh, Tomorrow Biostasis, which is right next to us, as well as uh, Alcor and Chronics Institute, which is also possible. So short term is really to get the movement happening, get people interested, talk about it, make more art about it, make it more accessible for the general public, and also to really learn about how we can work within the legal framework of France to legally get someone out and have a successful crowd preservation. So it is possible uh, because the three methods uh, you can choose are burial, cremation, or donation to science. So under this umbrella of donation to science, we're able to have our donor cards uh, of, for example, tomorrow biostasis, of which I'm a member, and, um, and also legally with the right paperwork and the right contacts in France and preparation of the people you know around you, really making sure your last wishes are known. Uh, it's, it is possible to, to have a, a 
successful crowd preservation with a little bit of, well, maybe a little more pres- um, preparation and uh, contacting the right people. Our long-term goals are to change the laws in France, to make this choice a legal choice because liberté is very important. And once, if there is a strong movement of people, I'm pretty confident that we can actually make things change. And there has been on a European level, um, a Spanish lawyer, Jordi Stanislas, who's proposed something to the European Court of Human Rights. And this is going to be potentially optimistic uh, for us as well, if there's something uh, mandated at a European level that we can really touch upon in France. So long-term goals, you know, uh, going the legal route, it's going to take uh, time, effort, and of course, uh, support. But I'm pretty confident that uh, we have a, a positive future in this regards. And as Emile and Max says, we're all interested in longevity. We want to live longer or possibly forever. And until we uh, attain that longevity escape velocity, we really need cryonics here and now because you could get hit by a bus tomorrow and no one knows. So that's really um, that's really my perspective. And I think uh, transhumanism and longevity, it's really convergent with cryonics. It's just not separate things because we all essentially have the same goal in the end. Well, uh, maybe or you prefer before because uh, your video is uh, ready. So maybe first of all, uh, the, re- the, the video? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Let, let's see, um, 120 seconds because we are going by second here. Uh, minute, uh, 120 second uh, video of uh, Spain, an activity we had just last weekend, Transvision Madrid last weekend in Madrid. Please, with sound. <laughs> Okay, so let me continue for two minutes before we get the presentation by Teya. So uh, last weekend we had an activity in Madrid to uh, position uh, formally cryonics in Spain. I already had another event five years ago, but this was really the the big launching. We brought the ambulance from the Netherlands. Um, there is uh, right now there are three ambulances: one that uh, belongs to Tomorrow by Stasis in Germany, one in the United Kingdom, and uh, this one in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So we brought that because it is the biggest one, the most sophisticated. It is a six hundred thousand euro ambulance. In fact, uh, the person who brought it in, he says it is the most advanced ambulance in the whole of the Netherlands. Uh, So this was very impactful. We were in basically all Spanish media, even today. We have been in the media for two weeks. So now everybody in Spain has heard about uh, cryonics or even better, we are beginning to use the word biostasis because biostasis has less of a bad uh, name in a way. And also because uh, Emil was talking about European Biostasis Foundation and the same in um, 
in the Netherlands. Uh, they are using the word biostasis. So we positioned this word biostasis. Uh, we had, um, as I said, all kind of TV and newspaper impact. Uh, we, we also had uh, uh, five lawyers in the conference, some of the, of the most important lawyers of Spain. And this one from um, Barcelona, who is working on this European initiative to basically uh, have the possibility of legal uh, cryopreservation or biostasis in general. Because we, if we use the word biostasis, we include many other things, not just traditional cryopreservation, but uh, different types of plastination, vitrification, hibernation, and the new persuflation. So there are many things that fit into the word um, biostasis. That is what we used it. Also, we have to be careful because there is a fraud in Spain, a new a fraud that just appeared at the same time we had the conference. There is, uh, you can watch it, uh, you can see it later. It's called I cryonic.com. It is a full fraud, sadly, based in Spain. It's the continuation of a previous fraud called Secreon. So these people that we managed to get out, now they are coming back uh, with a similar fraud and this new name, iCryonic.com. Uh, so, Didier, if you want to show that, because I think this is really disgusting. It just appeared uh, when we had the conference. So, really, really disgusting. Anyway, uh, but now let's see the presentation from uh, France. Thank you. I'm really proud because I'm not a computer techie person, and uh, this is the first time I've done a PowerPoint like since university, so I'm really happy to show it. <laughs> I'll be brief, though, because I will have already spoken about some of these things uh, earlier. So I really just wanted to do an overview about Chronic's uh, past, present, and future, and also I really want to thank Mark for inviting me here this weekend and for including cryonics in this event. I think it's really great that it's a subject that's going to become more more important in the uh, near future, especially with longevity and uh, and these kind of topics. So, um, oh yeah, this way. See, okay, good. Press the button. Okay, so why cryonics? Uh, and then I'll, I'll just briefly uh, what's happened in the past since the 1960s. 50 years have already gone by. Um, what we're trying to do right now is an association, and what our goals are for the future. Again, touched on these a little bit already. Okay, um, so why cryonics? I know Max uh, uh, had a really good way of explaining it, and Emil as well. It's really um, convergent with transhumanism because we have this goal of wanting to live uh, a great life and blissful uh, existence in the future. And until we're actually available to have that technology to prolong our lives, we need another option. So um, a possible chance or death. So for me, and hopefully a lot of you, we'll choose having the possible chance chance, even though, of course, right now it's not a guarantee because uh, we're not obviously at the point of having that technology. Um, there's a lot of promising research also. I think Emil touched upon this uh, and Max as well. I've been to a lot of chronics events in the last 10 years since being in France, uh, all over Europe and even uh, in the States. My first event at the teens and 20s where I met uh, Ben Best. And uh, there's a lot of really good research happening by a lot of prominent people doing, doing the research. Obviously, we need more funding. We need more research. But when you look at the, some of the results, it's a really optimistic for me. I'm not going to go into details, but you feel free to, if you want details, you can, you can look that up or you can ask me about particular um, scientists and researchers. But it's looking really good for the possibility of, of, of viable evidence-based cryonics. Um, and also just seems like a good idea, kind of summarizing the points uh, I said before. We all want to live longer, and this is a really um, kind of our, our main our main bet right now is to sign up for cryonics. Okay, so in the past, uh, as I mentioned, the Société Cryonics de France has been around since 1967, and Roland uh, Missonnier, who's our de d'honneur, can't be here today, but he's uh, the editor of Chronics News magazine, which he has published for over 50 years. It's a wealth of information. It's published in both English and in French. If you're interested in, in reading it, it's available uh, on our website, which you'll see later. And uh, so there's a lot of people involved back in the 60s. There were doctors, uh, lawyers, lots of people, uh, including um, uh, Dr. Martineau. And in 1970, so shortly after the 
the association was founded, they had um, a proposal to build a cryotorium, as they called it, uh, in France. They had the um, permission from the local uh, town hall. They had the permission from the sub-prefecture. But when it got to the level of the Secretary of the Interior, it was vetoed. So this was uh, unfortunate, obviously, for, for the development in France. And, uh, and then in 1981, um, Dr. Martineau, who was also part of the association, he had a, a castle in the Loire Valley, and he had built uh, pretty high-tech freezers in the basement of this castle and with, the, uh, with the goal of cryopreserving himself and his family. So in 1981, his wife unfortunately died from cancer and he uh, crowd preserved her there in his castle and at this made quite the buzz in French media and you can you can still see a lot of the a lot of the media around this and he actually to help fund the upkeep of the freezer he would let people come and visit the freezer and see the freezer so this is quite well known about and then in 2002, uh, Dr. Martineau died himself, and his son Remy took over uh, to respect the last wishes. He also preserved uh, his father, Dr. Martineau, in the second freezer. So this was um, a pretty a groundbreaking case for people trying to do it themselves. Uh, but at this point, when Dr. Martino died, uh, the Mary, uh, the local authorities intervened and they said, we need to put a stop to this because it's illegal. So the son, Remy, he actually launched a legal campaign. He had a lawyer to fight to respect his uh, parents' wishes. And they actually lost because the, the judge ruled, and this is, was really just an interpretation of the law, he ruled that it's not cremation and it's not burial, so it's illegal. So that was really unfortunate um, because the son was ready to take it to the European Court of uh, Human Rights. But in 2006, the temperature uh, indicator on the freezer malfunctioned, and um, both the doctor and his wife uh, were warmed to a temperature of, I think, minus 26. And Remy decided uh, there's no point going any further because what's the point? It's it's too late. There they've they've been thawed. So this was really unfortunate as well for Chronics in France because this could have been um, a precedent case, but uh, unfortunately it was quite negative. And because of these things. In France, we have a really negative public image about cryonics, lack of awareness. Um, often people say it's illegal, and so there's not a lot of real information out there. So that's what I'm, uh, I'm trying to help change. Oh, yeah. Okay, press forward button. So right now, um, like I mentioned, we have an association, and I'm super happy to uh, have some help. I've been doing this uh, since 2014. When Roland asked me to take over, I was very happy. Uh, but I since have had two young children. I'm a school director, a dance teacher, and an artist. So I had, in all my free time, I try to uh, do this, which until now has been it's been quite difficult. So we, um, we have, we're really trying to get people together, as I mentioned earlier, to help uh, disseminate information, awareness, education, contacts in funeral directors, people that can help us on site if we do have to help someone with a crowd preservation, um, and just have that support. So this is, I want to just point out, our wonderful new... Um, Secretary Kevin, who's sitting over there, uh, made the nice flyer with some information. So feel free afterwards as well if you want information or want, yes, thank you, to, to contact us. You can sign up for our association and we, uh, we are happy to, uh, to have new members. So, um, collaboration in Europe, also really important, uh, having someone like, uh, Tomorrow Biostasis nearby France, as well as working with the Dutch groups and the German groups, uh, in Europe. The more, uh, people and groups we have together, the stronger we'll be and the, the better we will be able to have successful cry cryopreservation. And yeah, really, uh, the goal is to create a movement. So for me, when I came to France, I really appreciated that when you have a movement in France, the people actually ha really have the power to make change with the protesting and and lots of, uh, lots of power. So I, I think that with uh, enough support from the population in France, we can really make things moving. So I'm really optimistic about it, especially the future. So like I said, um, we want to have a French standby team in major cities. Um, 
so that we can help intervene right away as soon as somebody, uh, somebody, something happens to one of our members. And this is really also why being part of an association where we know what your last wishes are, it's really going to help having that support. And changing the laws. Again, this is, a, this is kind of a, an optimistic long-term goal, but I'm pretty sure we can make it happen because um, it has happened before. And I think the fact that times are changing, the more awareness people have, have, they will say, hey, this might actually, this makes sense. Why shouldn't we have the right to choose that? Much like even other types of burial where, you know, you plant a tree and things like that. So I think uh, the, the liberty uh, part of it will help with this, uh, with help with this goal. Public acceptance. Again, even in transhumanism in longevity, we all know this is very challenging. But again, trying to make it, uh, trying to make it easy to understand and actually uh, norm normalize in a sense, what is cryonics? This is really something that uh, we should have the right to do. Um, that's really going to help. So the more we talk about it, the more we create art and uh, things to get in touch with people, the better the better we can we can be accepted by the public. Maybe eventually having a storage facility in France. France has almost 67 million people. Um, so you would think naturally, if we do have the legal right to do it, we may eventually think about um, creating something in France to uh, to help store people. But this is, again, we, we have Tomorrow Biostasis right next door, and we also have Alcor and CI, which are uh, have been around for a long time. So in the meantime, we're really just trying to work on um, step by step. So thank you. I'm really optimistic for a bright future. And um, you have my email and the new website as well on there. And uh, feel free to, uh, yeah, to approach us. We have uh, information and we have uh, Kevin and Matthias up there uh, who are here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, yes, uh, Jose, if you want to come back. Um, I will switch uh, to a certain number of questions, but I, I want to, to give the world to the audience as quickly as possible. So I was thinking, uh, I won't ask you exactly the same question I asked uh, to, to Max. You, you can if you remember a little bit. And uh, maybe now we will try to, to go toward the second part uh, of uh, the answering, was, was, which was uh, much more toward ethics questions. Um, one, which um, finally I, I don't ask to ask, maybe is, well, um, and just a little parenthesis, sorry. I have to say that uh, I'm not uh, quite, a, quite a, a lot of transhumanists, which are, which don't be, which are not convinced uh, by cryonics. All transhumanists are not uh, cryonists. Uh, there are almost a lot of them are skeptics. Um, so uh, it's not only to, to, to convince uh, the whole world, you have, first of all, to convince a certain number of transhumanists, even maybe longevities. Um, I close the parenthesis. Uh, I am one of the skeptics. Um, one uh, of the, the questions uh, may be, uh, well, um, it's quite uh, weird to uh, um, involved uh, in an, a project um, for um, whom the, 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 the result, it's, it's we, we, not, we don't know, we know nothing. Sorry, uh, maybe I will have to switch in French. <laughs> switch. Nous ne savons rien. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> nous ne savons rien sur le résultat et nous n'avons pas euh, ou nous ne sommes pas. Je parle pour un peu plus que moi-même. Euh, nous ne sommes pas convaincus de la moindre preuve de concept, comme on parlait de preuve de concept jusqu'à présent. Euh, je comprends les difficultés, à la fois les réelles difficultés techniques. Et les difficultés qui sont les mêmes que, par exemple, pour euh, le longévitisme, à savoir, on peut difficilement recueillir des fonds, euh, puisque tout ça euh, n'est pas reconnu comme soin, euh, et, et donc les autorités publiques, etc., ne vont pas accepter, même les grandes entreprises ne vont pas accepter d'y mettre un sou. Donc c'est d'autant plus difficile de faire de la recherche dans ce domaine. Euh, néanmoins, euh, le fait est que, euh, autant que je comprenne et que je lise sur le sujet, euh, je reste sceptique sur la possibilité déjà d'avoir la preuve de concept sur l'arrivée, le, le dégel. <rire> C'est-à-dire que pour ce qui est de la cryopréservation, là, c'est, me semble-t-il, convaincant. Par contre, sur euh, l'aboutissement, il me semble qu'on n'y est pas 
encore. Et il me semble que tant que euh, la cryonie n'aura pas démontré de manière suffisamment forte euh, qu'il y a vraiment voilà cette preuve de, de, de concept, alors il y aura des obstacles quasi insurmontables. Et que ça n'est pas seulement, par exemple, l'histoire du... Docteur Martineau, qui est assez tragique en effet, euh, ne, mais euh, voilà, ce sont des arguments de fond euh, qui risquent de continuer à bloquer le, la cryonie. L'un après l'autre, est-ce que vous voulez proposer des arguments euh, pour répondre à cette interrogation et cette interpellation avant qu'on demande au public Um, juste pour répondre, to respond to that about uh, the uh, revival part, I wanted to bring it this weekend, but it's a giant book that's really heavy. Ashwin de Wolf uh, offered it to me last weekend in Madrid. It's called Cryostasis Revival. Um, I don't know, maybe we can also put the cover of that on, on the online. And this is a tome, uh, very thick, with scientific uh, research. A lot of the prominent researchers in uh, in cryopreservation about methods and um, and ways that will be possible to revive someone. So I don't know, Emile, if maybe you have more to say on that. Uh, sure, yeah, a lot more. Uh, I don't know if you can oh, this, I think this works, okay. right. All right, so um, regarding to revival, so I, th I think there's there's a couple of fundamental things about cryonics, right? I never want to be cryopreserved, Right. I very much hope that in 20 years I need to go to all my longevity friends and tell them, hell, listen, I'm wrong, you were right. Now just please give me the treatment, give me the pill, give me the medication, and then I just live on, right? Absolutely. But if um, I'm getting diagnosed with an incurable cancer tomorrow, or get hit by a car, or die at 85, I damn well want to be rather cryopreserved than buried or cremated, right? So... It's, it's not that cryopreservation is a great option. It is the best option in comparing to, to the other ones, right? Now, regarding revival, it's, it's very difficult to argue exactly how revival will work, right? Because you would need to basically predict what will be possible in 100 years from now or 50 years from now or 150 years from now or 200 years, right? So relatively far in the future. There is a good amount of um, at least like kind of, I wouldn't call it proof, but kind of signs like proof of principle that it might work in principle right so there's this paper from natasha vitamore that shows that you can preserve c elegans and when you bring them back they keep their memory of course we're talking about a worm here so memory is of course kind of in quotation marks um you can you have started to bring back larger volumes like um, kidneys from from rabbits and so on i would always argue that i think cryopreservation Everybody here who is kind of toying with the idea of or thinking about the idea of signing up probably needs to make this call without knowing, right? So I'm pretty sure that in 50 years from now, when I might need to be cryopreserved, I will not know if at that point revival will be possible. But then again, the alternative is worse. I'm very confident in personally for me making that choice Um, as long as I'm not aware of anything, why it fundamentally cannot work, right? And revival indeed is a big problem, but um, Thea already brought up the book from Robert Freyes, um, one of the preeminent nanotechnology experts, um, which basically lays out a blueprint plan from A to Z, how revival would potentially work, right? Um There's a lot of new nano uh, warming and, and uh, we're considering funding this project in, in, in Spain um, with ultrasound warming and so on. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And one more important point, cryopreservation so far has, has worked or has done research with a couple of million funding per year. So small, small laughable small amounts right so the hope of course what i'm working for is is bringing more people into the into the fold um, and increasing research funding as well and last but not least regarding all these f fraud cases they're all irrelevant like no one signs up at these organizations it's just someone who puts up a web page and says I, I i zero care about them like um and in fact i think like talking about them is like totally a waste of time because <laughs> because again no one really cares about them um So I think everybody pretty much is aware who are the organizations that are trustworthy. So uh, at least, yeah. <clears throat>
Um, okay. Um, in fact, we had this conference in Madrid last weekend, and um, they both were present. We released the book uh, uh, Cryostasis Revival, um, written by uh, Robert Freitas, with the prologue by Greg Fay. Greg Fay is one of the people who invented the vitrification that is used today for uh, in vitro fertilization, thanks to which 8 million humans have been born. So to reply to your question, this works. This works so well that 8 million humans have been frozen. Of course, as little embryos or even uh, eggs, but they have been frozen. So the proof of concept is there. It is right there. I have been following this also for many years, and um, I cover that in my book. Remember that I invite you, I will present it tomorrow here in Paris, La Mort de la Mort. And I am working now on a new book just about cryonics, about cryopreservation. It will be the first full book in Spanish about all the science of cryonics and the revival how it will work. Uh, 70 years ago, even freezing sperm was impossible. So we need to put this in historical context. In 70 years ago, there was no f freezing of sperm and revival. 60 years ago, there was no freezing and revival of embryos. And now more and more organs are being um, cryonically suspended or vitrified and, and revived, um, beginning with... Uh, organs now, full organs. First it was cells, uh, little embryos, tissues, and now there are full organs like kidneys of rabbits, for example. So this is, will continue. In fact, our Spanish scientist working on this, Ramon Risco, he believes that in five to ten years we will probably be able to freeze or to vitrify uh, hearts, lungs, and maybe five years later, even whole brains, whole brains. Of course, the revival part is the second problem. We don't know how that will, will, will work, but indeed, also Natasha Vitamur, as Emil announced, uh, you know, she did this experiment with some Spanish uh, uh, scientists as well in 2015, and they proved that um, worms uh, can keep their memories, or at least their Pavlov reflex. So these worms that were trained with the Pavlov reflex and were frozen for many worm lives and then reanimated, they kept their Pavlov reflex, and also they were reproductive uh, uh, active. They had little worms, you know, after they were reanimated. So to me, this is very clear. It is a question of time. And that is what cryonics is. Cryonics is an ambulance in time. It is an ambulance not in a space that will take you from your home to the hospital. It is an ambulance in time from today where we have very primitive technology compared to what we will have in the future and the medicine of the future. So to me, there is no question if this is possible. The proof of concept is there. And to me, it's uh, not uh, if it is possible, but when it will be possible to reanimate people. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll switch to questions. Uh, uh, you see, uh, in my question to Max, uh, I had some uh, more ethical question, but uh, yes, uh, it's preferable. Oh, okay, you take the mic. Well, thank you again for uh, your presentations. Uh, I think uh, cryonics is a really interesting case because uh, when I see transhumanists struggling to make um, their ideas I'm audible and uh, etc., I think it's the same thing with cryonics, with cryonicists um, uh, in regards to transhumanists. And the question is for you, maybe... Mr. Cordero, it's like you being maybe a transhumanist, but at the same time, um, you're pro-cryonics. How do you bridge those two um, cosmogonies, if I would say? And can you take us through the main, um, I mean, achievements in, in cryonics? Uh, are there any animals who have been uh, uh, revived? Or is it like just a question of reanimation? Or now every, everything and everybody can be uh, cryopreserved? So, yeah, I think this cryonics is a really interesting case for transhumanists, for the society, and cryonics towards transhumanists. So that's... Well, that is a very, very short question that requires a long explanation. But it is all in my book. Chapter 8, it is about cryopreservation. But uh, yes, we try to explain that since this began about 70 years ago, we have been going into better uh, 
organs and eventually uh, bigger organisms. Like right now, we can basically do this with worms, different types of worms, uh, knowing that it, they can be completely reanimated, keeping their memories and keeping their reproductive capabilities. Uh, the forecast, which is also in this book, if you, you can download it free from the Alcor Foundation website. It is called Cryostasis Revival. It is 700 pages long, but just read the, the prologue, which is only four pages, because Greg Fay, who invented vitrification that is used for in vitro fertilization today, he talks about what he sees coming in the next 20 years. And, and basically, and, and this is Spanish scientist, Ramon Risco, they agree that in the next 5, 10, 20 years, we will be able to cryonically suspend, vitrify, or equivalent any organ of the body, including the brain, and be ready for soon afterwards be able to reanimate them, and maybe in a different substrate, which is also important. We might be post-biological. We might be able maybe to read your brain and all of that. Uh, concerning being a transhumanist, to me, in a way, all these things are related. I believe in a super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness, which are the main three pillars of uh, um, traditional uh, transhumanism. And um, there are many ways to achieve that. And if I, if I die, which I do not plan to die, and I make it clear to everybody, I think I will make it to 2045, which is the date given by my friend Ray Kurzweil for rejuvenation technologies. I strongly believe in that. And also longevity escape velocity by 2030. And I plan to be there both for 2030 and, and 2045. It doesn't matter how old I am because we are going to have rejuvenation technologies. But as Emil said, accidents happen. You know, if a piano falls on my head, I will be pianized. Well, and there might not be much left of my brain, so it might not be good to cryopreserve a broken or destroyed brain. But even then, I want it to be uh, cryopreserved because I don't know what the future technology will do. And because even if your brain gets destroyed in a certain way, it can be probably reconstructed in a similar way. I am an, an engineer. Engineers, we see what is possible. And to me, this is very possible. So anyway, to me, they are perfectly compatible. I don't see a problem with any of these ideas. And that is why I'm working on a book on cryonics. Oui, super. <laughs> uh, donc, vous venez de dire, d'ailleurs, que d'ici 20 ans, à peu près, on pourrait... Uh, congelé et conserver un cerveau entier. Donc j'en déduis que aujourd'hui, euh, je ne parle même pas de la preuve de concept du, du dégel, mais simplement du gel. Euh, pour l'instant, ça n'est pas réalisé. C'est-à-dire si demain une voiture me me renverse, euh, mon cerveau, de toute façon, on ne sait pas. Si je comprends bien ce que vous venez de dire, on ne sait pas le congeler correctement. Alors, je voulais justement vous demander quel était le statut aujourd'hui de l'efficacité des cryoprotectants, puisque je sais que vous utilisez des, des cryoprotectants pour retarder, je crois, l'effet des, des cristaux de glace qui détruisent les, les, les neurones et les cellules des neurones, et combien de temps prend une congélation d'un cerveau humain et est-ce que ce temps, je sais qu'on parlait dans le temps de fast freezing, c'est-à-dire qu'effectivement il fallait obtenir un fast freezing pour obtenir une vraie conservation du cerveau parce que bah, c'est comme un, un morceau de viande quand vous le mettez au congélateur, il peut mettre une heure, deux heures, trois heures pour congeler à cœur. Or, effectivement, les neurones commencent à se dégrader, je crois, dans les dans les trois, quatre minutes, c'est ça euh, dans l'heure, on va dire. Donc voilà, je voulais savoir où vous en étiez de cette, des technologies du gel, en fait. Je ne vous demande même pas sur la, la résurrection. Qui veut répondre Parce que tous les trois êtes susceptibles de répondre. Dis Because yes, I, I might have, I have uh, uh, been said something that was not properly understood. Uh, what these scientists are saying, we will be able to vitrify these organs and re-implant them. Right now, we can do this only to the kidney level of a rabbit. Uh, you can actually vitrify a kidney rabbit and then implant it into another animal. So they expect that in 10 years, maybe 20 years at the latest, we will basically be able to vitrify or cryonically suspend or do biostasis of any organ and then transplant it into another organism. But uh, Emil knows a lot about this and he's a medical doctor, so I want to listen to you. <laughs> right. So you can do the cryopreservation part of a brain right now, right? 
how good the quality of that cryopreservation is. You, so you mentioned ice formation. So how much ice formation happens, how many ice crystals form, depends on if the cryopreservation is done, A, with the state-of-the-art technology, and then how much ischemia was there. So basically, ischemia means how long the brain was not supplied sufficiently with oxygen. We're not talking minutes here, right? So it can be probably... So, so you want to start at the latest cooling after one so one hour after circulatory rest so one hour after your heart stops in an, in a good case not in a perfect case but in a good case you want to start cooling if you start cooling basically what you do you reduce the amount of oxygen the brain needs basically you reduce the metabolic rate right Metaz metabolism runs slower in turn less oxygen is needed and less brain cells die Right, so neurons do. There have been cases where people died. Um, basically, their heart stopped beating in skiing accidents, where they fell in water. An hour after circulatory rest, the heart hasn't been beating for an hour. They were revived and made a full recovery. There's a saying in medicine that says you're only dead if you're warm and dead. Right, and that's kind of the core principle of cryopreservation. But revival is a different beast. Right, so I would never say in 20 years this will work. This might take way longer. Right, I hope it will work in 20 years, but there's no good data yet that shows us that we have anywhere. You know, we're all, we're close. This might be very far away. Just to understand, uh, when you cool, so you don't cool at. Um je repasse au français, euh, à des températures, euh, à des températures de, de cryonique, c'est un refroidissement euh, comme dans de l'eau froide. En fait, il y a deux, deux phases, c'est bien ça. Une phase où on refroidit légèrement, on va dire, pour ralentir la, 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 la mort des cellules, avant la cryonie. C'est ce, ce que je voulais juste comprendre. Absolutely. So the process is the following, right? So when we call what we call stabilization, you basically start cooling with ice water and you give metabolic support. So chest compressions and oxygen and medication to reduce the metabolic rate and cool the body down, right? With that, you gain time. Right, that is to being done in some ORs right now for gunshot vict victims to gain more time for operation. So you basically do a very similar procedure. Now, you cool down that way to around 20 degrees. At that time, you start internal cooling. Basically, you put a hard lung machine connected to the circulatory system. And just like in an operation room, you would now circulate through the body cooled cryoprotective agent at low concentrations. And then before you cross zero degrees where you might get ice formation, right? At that point, you would like to already have the highest concentration of cryoprotective agent in the body. And the cryoprotective agent basically draws out water from the cells and replaces the fluids against the cryoprotective agents so that you have no ice formation. This is an ideal case. In an average case, there is some amount of ice formation. But in an ideal case, that what would, what would we do, what you do. And then you cool down to minus 80 And then from minus 80, you cool down to around minus 120. And from there, you cool very, 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 very slowly down to one negative 196. So there's many different cooling steps at different, at different temperatures. Any question about ethics? I want it. <laughs> Merci. Eh bien, je voudrais savoir quel idée, quel concept de l'homme se trouve au comment dire ça à la base de la cryonisation depuis que je, je vous entends je vois qu'il ne s'agit que de chimie, de corps de matériel, enfin oui et je, je sais que dès le départ euh, Marc lui-même a dit, quoi pas la résurrection, le retour de celui qui pourrait retourner, re, retourner revenir, serait-il le retour d'un homme tel que nous, nous, le, nous, nous le donnons aujourd'hui à douer d'un corps et d'une âme Parce que le mot âme n'est pas prononcé. C'est pour ça que je pose la question de savoir s'il si s'agit simplement de l'être vivant dont on prend les cellules, dont on prend les organes pour transplanter, on s'occupe plus de l'histoire, de la mémoire, 
de la conscience. Qu'est-ce que ça devient Tout ce que j'ai entendu jusqu'ici, j'ai écouté patiemment, mais je ne vois que des élaborations de leur travail sur les souris, sur les animaux, enfin bref. Est-ce que l'homme dont il s'agit dans la crionisation est encore un homme Je m'arrête là. So, when you talk about um, the soul or l'homme, um, you th when you were talking about preserving a physical body, uh, it can make sense with p for people who are spiritual because if you believe in a soul, then your soul leaves your body. So, you're just preserving the body. Uh, again, the question about where memories are is is your body, your person, and your personality. Um, we can be somewhat certain, uh, maybe Emile can talk a little more about that technically, but that the, the brain is really sort of the computer of our body and that this is what uh, animates us. Um, but it's not everything. So I think that it's not contradictory to uh, to adhere to cryonics and still believe in a soul because you're just uh, preserving your physical body. If the soul can leave, then maybe it can go somewhere else. And when the body can come back, your soul can come back to your body. For me, this idea is maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe possible to support cryonics. Again, um, we can't say for sure. But we can say that with a good, uh, a good preservation of the brain, we can be relatively optimistic that we will be able to reverse damage uh, caused by the cryoprotection procedure and possibly the revival procedure so that you are still you. That's just my opinion. I don't know if you want to. Uh, I will add um, a couple of things quickly. Well, what are you? You know, if I take your heart and I put another heart, you are still you, I hope. If I take your lungs and I put also mechanical lungs, you are still you. I, I can take your legs. I can take your uh, arms. Basically, everything except for your brain. I think your brain is 99% of you. So, and that is the only thing we don't know how to transplant. Uh, so, to me, if we preserve the brain, we are preserving you. That is also why I'm in favor of neuropreservation. I don't want my old body. In fact, I, for a reanimation, I want a brand new body. And because the body can be cloned for one thing, but also in 30, 40 years in the future, I will probably have a cyborg body. But just to finish with the ethic points also, because you mentioned that, I think this is like medicine. Like we want to cure cancer. We want to cure Parkinson's. We want to cure people who die. And we know in the future we might have the technology to cure people. And why I'm worried about frauds, maybe in Germany that is not a problem, but in Spain we have had many frauds with, with stem cells and uh, umbilical cords. You know, 20 years ago there were some people that went to the maternities and they said, oh, we are going to freeze your umbilical cord of the baby, the stem cells of the baby. They charged 2,000 uh, euros well, at that time was pesetas. And then they threw everything out. They just kept going to maternities, getting money, getting money, getting money. And so uh, uh, you not only had to be saint, you have to appear saint. This was said about the, the wife of uh, Julius Caesar. So in Spain, we have had uh, several frauds on many medical issues. And, and we are not talking just to Spain. What is happening in Russia is a disaster for cryonics. And this is very f famous also in the USA. It's called the Chatsworth uh, cryonics disaster. Chatsworth, many people were um, left to to uh, to tow and to die. And, and this was a real tragedy. Several patients died that way. So I think we have to be very ethical. We have to, to be and to appear ethical. So I am against all these fronts. So we have to di distance ourselves. And I don't know why you say that you don't care, Emil. This is a bad name. What is happening in Russia is a bad name even for you. So, so I didn't say I don't care. I don't care. I don't think it's a relevant factor. Right. Like again, no one who's in their right mind signs up at any of these organizations. Right. So, so it's, it's a side note. 
Um, so that, that's what I mean. And also, in, yeah, in the U.S., in the, there were some problems in the past, but um, this, was, this was structurally, these organizations, this cannot happen again, at least at the current organizations. And maybe to really brief you, briefly answer, because I actually very much disagree with you. <laughs> um, so, so in, of course, I think the type of person who signs up for cryopreservation believes that memory, personality, consciousness, everything that we value as ourselves is an emerging quality from the connection in our brain. Basically, you are your brain, as you Jose said, said, right? So as long as we keep the brain around with good quality, then technically the, cap the capacity of you being alive is still around. And of course, soul for me is a very difficult, it, it's basically a belief. It's very difficult to argue that scientifically. So I, if someone believes in a soul, I don't think they necessarily need cryopreservation. Um, but on the other hand, hand also cryopreservation is not going to hurt if it turns out to be true in the end. Yeah, just, just to respond to that, I, I don't believe in a soul or anything like that. I was just trying to say people who are spiritual, um, it could still adhere to cryonics because it's, it's just your physical vehicle that's being preserved. However, I do also want my physical body, uh, to come back to as a dancer. You know, there's muscle memory, there's things also that are, are in the rest of my body. But of course, the brain being the most important part as, as sort of the headquarters of, of this sensation of, of self. Merci. Oui. Peut-être. Je pense que le débat n'est pas euh, terminé. Nous ne pouvons pas le terminer. Il y a un grand nombre de, de questions aiguës qui demandent à être discutées. Nous aurons d'autres occasions, j'en suis certain, de poursuivre tous ces débats. Je vous remercie. On fait une petite, petite pause. Cinq minutes, je dirais. Merci.